Thank you very much, dear uh, Professor Dr. Freedom of Hoffman, for this uh, nice introduction. Uh, actually, uh, uh, as I said, uh, I'm so uh, proud to be one of the organizers of this conference, but also I am so proud as well because I will be one of the speakers of this great Egyptological event. As you know, the title of my lecture is about the Libyan war of Ramesses II. During the Ramesside period, the military conflicts with the Libyans were very significant in the reigns of Siti I, Merimbeta, and Ramses III. The historical records and war scenes of these warrior pharaohs at Karnak or Medinet Habu provide valuable information and details concerning these wars that took place at the western frontier of Egypt. It has been noted that there is some textual and archaeological evidence from the reign of the warrior pharaoh Ramses II indicate that a military confrontation with the Libyans may have taken place at Egypt's western frontier. This paper surveys and discusses this textual and archaeological evidence that indicates the presence of a Libyan war during the reign of Ramesses II. Firstly, we have to talk about the historical aspects of the Libyan war of Ramesses II in his Nubian temples of Abu Simbel and Beit el Wali. The Libyan scenes of Ramesses II in Abu Simbel and Beit el Wali can be correlated to military conflicts that occurred during his reign. In the scene depicted in the lower register of the southern wall in the main hall of the great temple of Abu Simbel, Ramses II is shown trampling on one Libyan and spearing another. Both of Antony's Palinger and Labib Habashi envisage this scene as a copy of a vignette from City the First Libyan War scene at Karnak. This scene is accompanied with a rhetorical text as follows. The good God who slays the nine poles, who trembles down the foreign countries of the northerners, victorious king, who is sent against the foreign countries, a swordsman valiant like Monto, who carries off the land of Nubia to the north land or delta, and the Asiatics to Nubia. He has placed the Shasso in the west land, and he has settled the Libyans, Tehenu, on the ridges. Filled are the strongholds he has built with the blunder of his recent strong arm or sword, one who slays Horo or Palestine with his sword, Retinu or Syria, having fallen to his slaughtering. Actually, Kenneth Kitchen argues that this rhetorical text accompanying the slain of the Libyan is appropriate to the universal theme of the entire world as it celebrates the king's supremacy in all four quarters of his world. Additionally, a further dimension is added, the concept of exile, of transferring defeated foes or populations to other parts of an imperial domain, so as to retain the economic advantage of their manpower and productivity, but as torn from their traditional home and roots, being dependent wholly on the good graces of their, of their state masters. Exil is here affected by shifting the resistance in each zone to its opposite cardinal point in the king's domain. In practice, as the text then mentions, such transplantees could be established in new settlements or press ganged into the army, serve in new forts as conscript troops. The same concept was expressed also almost a century later by Ramses III and found expression in his resettling captured Libyan fighters in garrison forts in the East Delta. The exact location of the resettlement of the Libyans to Hino on the ridges is unknown. It has been suggested by Kitchen, however, that this was located somewhere in the East Delta or of Canaan. So it may have been anywhere along the Levantine coast, which was under the control of the Egyptians. Therefore, I think that this clear mention of transferring the defeated Libyans to the East Delta, turtle backs or hills of Canaan, refers to the victory of Ramses II in his war against them. And this could be more emphasized because this rhetorical text accompanied the Libyan war scene of the king. Um, however, 
This agrees with another text of Ramesses II recorded on an obelisk from Tanis, which suggests that Ramesses II forcibly resettled segments of, Libyan, of the Libyan population in the East. This text reads simply, settling the East with the Libyans Tehino. In one of the trial scenes that depicted at the main hall, east wall of the great temple of Abu Simbel, Ramses II is shown followed by his car, smites Libyan captives in the presence of Ra Hur Akhti, who is represented with his right arm outstretched, extending the heavy sword of victory towards the king. This scene is accompanied with a rhetorical text about the valor of the king and his mighting for the Syrians and Nubians. But it is observable that the Libyans have not been mentioned. The episodes of the king and the speech of Rahor Akhti that flatter the valor and victories of the king had been registered as well. A text registered over the Libyan captives reads, trampling down the sheaves of, of every foreign country, reducing them to non-existence. The final scene that can be correlated to the Libyan war of Ramses II at the temples of Abu Simbel is this triumph seen on the east wall of the hall, north side of the small temple of Abu Simbel. In this scene, Ramses II is shown followed by Nevertari smiting a Libyan captive before Horus of Maha, who is represented with his right arm outstretched, extending the heavy sword of victory towards the king. This scene is accompanied with a rhetorical text as follows. The good God, mighty in renown, victory's lion, uh, sorry, victorious lion, Lord of the sword who rounds up the rebellious lands. Libya, Tehinu, is fallen to your sword, and the nine powers are slain under your sandals, like Ra forever. O king of Abar and lower Egypt, Western Might Ra, Setep and Ra, Horus Falcons, strong bull, beloved of might. On the northern wall of the entrance hall of the temple of Betel Wali, the other Libyan war scene of Ramses II is depicted. There, Ramses II is represented executing a Libyan captive, bitten on the buttocks by the king's dog. The king wields the heavy sword at the head of the Libyan captive who implores mercy, while Egyptian officers and the crown prince, Amun Her Wenemuf, extol the king. This scene is accompanied with a rhetorical text behind the king as follows The good God, mighty in renown, the victorious line, master of the sword, who rounds up the rebellious lands. Libya, Tehinu, is fallen to your sword, and the nine poles are slain under your sandals, like Ra daily, forever and ever. In this scene, we have to say, it is remarkable, in this scene that the king's dog also attacks the Libyan chief. The lowly nature of Pharaoh's antagonist is no better shown than through this image, one that never occurs with any other Egyptian opponent. Henry Fisher has referred to this scene and noted that dogs were used in military operations in the Western desert. Accordingly, it seems that this scene refill, uh, refers, uh, refers to real events of the battle that took place between the Egyptians and the Libyans at the Western frontier of Egypt. Additionally, on the inner hall, east wall of the temple of Beit el Wali, Ramses II is depicted in a triumph scene on the north side, smiting Libyan in the presence of Ra Hur Akhti. Only, only the arm of the gods outstretched is visible, extending the heavy sword of victory towards the king. Next to this scene, a, rhetor a rhetorical text had been recorded as follows. The good god slaying Libya, Jehenu, powerful of strength, great in renown, the king of upper and lower Egypt, the lord of the two lands, Western might Ra given life, forever. Moreover, the text describes this scene as crushing the northern foreign land. So we have a comment here. The triumph scenes of the warrior Ramesside Pharaohs, in which the king is represented smiting ethnic groups or individuals of northern and southern enemies with his mace in the presence of gods, usually occurred in relation with narrative battle scenes in order to glorify the victories of the warrior pharaohs. According to previous Egyptologists, the triumph scenes are a generalized summary of the battle reliefs during the Ramesside period. Therefore, I think that the triumph scenes of Ramses II in his Nubian temples of Abu Simbel and Beit el-Wali 
in which the king is depicted smiting a Libyan captives in the presence of gods, are associated with the other Libyan war scenes of the king, which recorded in the same temples in order to commemorate his military victory over the Libyans during his reign. The rhetorical texts that accompanied both of the Libyan triumph and war scenes of Ramses II in his Nubian temples may confirm my opinion according to the mention of the Libyans Tehenu, as enemies in these texts. This is an aspect that could be considered as historically valid. The scenes are now deprived of their pure symbolic character referring to real historical events. Furthermore, almost without exception. The presentation of the heavy sword in these triumph scenes is accompanied with statements proclaiming the inevitable victory of the king over the enemies to be smitten with the divinely given weapon. As Alan Schulman claims, the presentation of the sword illustrates two distinct concepts, the commissioning of the king to undertake a war, and on the other hand, the triumphal outcome of a war, the triumphal outcome of a war. Accordingly, the Libyan triumph and war scenes of Ramesses II at his Nubian temples of Abu Simbel and Beit el-Wali and their accompanying texts have been to emphasize the victory of Ramesses II over his Libyan enemies. Now, we have to discuss the historical aspects of the Libyan war of Ramesses II in his forts at the Libyan frontier. Ramses II constructed a series of military forts or staging posts along the 200 mile long coastal road linking the western edge of the Delta and the fortress of Zawiyat Omar Rahim, located about 15 miles west of Marsa Matua near the modern Libyan border. There may have been at least three such posts at Karm Abu Gurg, El Garbaniyat, and El Alamin. According to the excavations by Stephen Snape of the University of Liverpool at the site of Zawet Omar Rahm in 1997, the construction of this chain of forts was launched by Ramses II very early in his reign. The military constructions were, uh, constructions were almost certainly connected to confrontations with the Libyans. The three known forts at El Garbaniyat, El Alamin, and Zawet Umar Rahim were probably only a few of a whole chain, never more than two days' quick march or one day's chariot ride apart. This series of garrisons could thus keep watch on movement by Libyan tribesmen and could swiftly report back to Egypt any significant news and call an expeditionary force to counter any invasion threat as soon as it materialized. According to the military title held by the Lieutenant Commander of Chariotry, Marie Atom, Idnu in Tanit Hitori in Neptawi, Ba Rouge Eminent, or Lieutenant Commander of the Chariotry of the Lord of the Two Lands in the Western Tract or Delta region, dating to the reign of Ramesses II, it seems that there are chariot coups associated with these forts for the military operations against the Libyans in the Western frontier during this period. It has been noted in the later Libyan wars of Merimbetah and Ramses III that the Libyans had chariot coup as well. Hence, this military title suggests that the presence of the Egyptian chariotry as the Western frontier's force may be related to a Libyan war during the reign of Ramses II. Labib Habashi has stated that in places in the middle of the passage of the temple fortress of Ramses II in Zawit Omar Rahm, there are traces of scenes showing the king getting out of his chariot to smite his enemies. Moreover, the victory of Ramses II over the Libyans was recorded on a door jamb at his fort in Zawit Omar Rahm as follows, good and valiant God, destroying Libya, Tehenu, King of Abar and Lower Egypt, Lord of the Two Lands, Wesermaitra, Setib and Ra. 
From the stele that discovered in the fortress of Ramses II in Zawit Omar Rahm during the excavations of Labib Habashi and referring to the victory of the king over the Libyans, is Stella SCR register number 74 with two cartouches in the center flanked by two circles. Underneath the cartouches are two Libyans, chieftains laying on their bellies, head to feet, their heads at the outside edge of the stela. Additionally, in the upper register of the stela of the standard bearer, Amun Misu from Zawit Omar Rahim, Ramses II is depicted smiting a Libyan captive in the presence of Amun, who is shown at the same scale of the king and offers a sword to him. I think that the scene of this stela is very significant because the owner of the stela is a military officer. This indicates that Amun Misu may have participated personally in the military operations against the Libyans under the command of his king. Furthermore, at the top register of the other private stela from Zawit Omar Rahim, now in SCA magazine of Marsa Matruh, SCA register number 89, Ramses II is depicted slaughtering a Libyan captive. He stands on the right holding his prisoner by hair in the center and holds his bow in the same hand. The king raises his scimitar above his head and seems to be wearing the blue crown. Two cartoons are placed in front of his face. He is accompanied by his lion, which stands at his side and is slightly in front of him which seems appropriate in view of the accompanying goddess. The prisoner is on one knee with his head turned back towards the king and with one of his hands raised begging for mercy. Behind the king is goddess Sekhmet with one, with one arm raised and a sun disk on her head. At the left of the scene is the god Amun, very damaged, but standing his arm his arms raised, perhaps offering him sword of victory to the king. Alan Schulman has advanced the theory that smiting scenes on private Ramesside stele reflect in part actual historical events, as well as an abstract repeating forever aspect. And that the prototypes for the motifs showing are primarily derived from contemporary temple walls. In general terms, the sword presentation theme appears in two principal contexts. The commissioning of the king by the god to undertake a war and conflated with prisoner slaughtering scenes at the successful conclusion of such a war. Schulman believes that for these scenes, as shown on the temple walls, as at Medinet Habu, where the king comes into the presence of commissioning gods, like Amun and Khonsu and led by Thoth, the scene on the wall is the reflection of an actual ritual where the part of the gods was played by appropriately masked priests. Both of Stephen Snape and Benny Wilson noted that if the, the, depiction, if the depictions of slaughtering the enemies on the stele of Zawit Omar Rahim represent actual events witnessed by the private dedicators in front of the temples of the gods, showing on stele, Zawit Omar Rahm would have witnessed the king in person carrying out ritual smiting of Libyans in front of a temple dedicated to Amun and Sekhmet, presumably at the end of a major Libyan campaign early in his reign. On the other hand, in the upper part of the red granite fragmentary stela of Ramses II from his fort at Al Alamin, now in the Open Air Museum of Pompey Spiller and the Serapio, SCA register number 343, the king is depicted holding the heavy sword of victory in the right hand and seizing with the other the hair of one or more captives. Opposite was the figure of a deity referred to as Shu, the son of Ra, the great god. May he give all victory. The king has above him the wars, horse, strong armed, and his cartoons preceded by the usual episodes and followed by the traditional wishes. On the other side, there are just some names and episodes of the king and unknown god. On the back of the other 
or lower part of the stela, now in the open air museum of Pompey Spiller and the Cerabium, SCR gesture number 342, there are parts of five lines praising the power of the king. The inscription on the front is quite important. Unfortunately, it is quite fragmentary, but enough is left to give us an, an idea of its contents. The Libyan War of Ramses II is recorded as follows. King of Abar and Lower Egypt, with Sir Maitra, Setib and Ra, son of Ra, Ramses II, given life, dot, 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 as you see. The enemies and their families, he overthrew, like Monto, on his right, at fighting. King of Abar and Lower Egypt, with Sir Maitra, Setib and Ra, son of Ra, Ramses II, given life. He blundered the Libyan land, Ribu or Libo, in the moment of his power, acting then dots as you see. <clears throat> it is significant to note that this text is the first one that mentions the Libo as the main Libyan enemy in the textual evidence of Ramesses II's Libyan war and in all the Egyptian sources as well. The Libo are thought to have held from the coastal region of Cyrenaica, but Georgian Osing, who would place the territory of the Libo in the region of El Alamin. They were the major element in the Libyan invasion of year five of King Merembetah, the successor of Ramesses II. Hence, I think that this text provides valuable information about the details of the Libyan war of Ramesses II, because it has referred clearly to the major element in this war. Now we are going to discuss the Libyan war of Ramesses II in his significant historical texts. The Libyan war of Ramesses II is described as a historical event on a rhetorical stela from, from Tanis as follows. Libya, the Hinu, is cast down under his feet. His slaughtering has prevailed over them. He has captured the country of the West, transformed into soldiery to serve him. Kenneth Kitchen argues that the victory claimed in Libya with Libyans brace ganged into the Egyptian army in the text of this tela may be reflected in the establishment of a chain of forts like those found at Al Alamin and Zawiyat Umur Rahim. On the other hand, I think that the Stella's text reference to the employment of the Libyan captives in the Egyptian military service during the reign of Ramesses II could be considered as a clear textual evidence that the Libyan war of Ramesses II had taken place. This text calls to mind the employment of the Sheridan warriors in the Egyptian military service after the victory of Ramesses II over them in the beginning of his reign. Sheridan raiders had attacked the Nile Delta sometime before Ramesses II's northern campaign. After the attack of Sheridan on Egypt, they were captured, impressed into the Egyptian army, and become one of the best troops employed by the Egyptians during the Ramesside period. It is noticeable that the narration of Ramesses II's victories over the Sheridan in the Tanis Stella directly follows a, a reference to the king's slaughter of the Libyans. Accordingly, the phrase he has captured the country of the West, transformed into soldiery to serve him, would have meant that Ramses II had captured a number of Libyan captives after his battle with them, then he employed them as auxiliary forces in his army. However, the Libyan prisoners of war who have been enrolled in the army resettled to the east of Egypt in Nechtu or strongholds as noted before, or settled in towns or demu bearing Ramses II's name, as stated in a lot of Egyptian uh, texts before. Moreover, the victory of Ramses II over the Libyans had been recorded on Aswan Stila of year, of year two as follows. The Libyans are fallen through dread of him or Ramses II, as you see the text, it is clear. Finally, in a section of Papyrus Anastasi II that praised Ramses II as a warrior, 
the military victory of Ramesses II over the Libyans had been recorded as follows. The Libyan land, Ribu or Libu, is fallen to his murderousness, fallen to his sword. As discussed before, the Libu were first prominent as opponent in the red granite fragmentary stela of Ramesses II from his fort at El Alamein. This section attested that they were the major element in Ramesses II's Libyan war. Now we have to say the conclusion. Textual and archeological evidence from the Nubian temples of Ramesses II of Abu Simbel and Betel Wali refers to battles against the Libyans. In the rhetor rhetorical text that accompanies the remarkable Libyan war scene of Ramses II at the Great Temple of Abu Simbel, it has been stated that the king transferred the defeated Libyans to the East Delta turtle packs or hills of Canaan. This agrees with another text of Ramses II's obelisk from Tanis and refers to the crushing victory of the king over the Libyans in a battle, taking into consideration the fact that Ramesses III had resettled his captured Libyan warriors in garrison forts in the East Delta almost a century later after his victory over them in his Libyan wars. On the other hand, the rhetorical text that accompanied the other Libyan war scene of Ramesses II at the Temple of Betel Wali refers clearly to the victory of the king over the Libyans. It seems that this scene refers to real events of the battle that took place between the Egyptians and the Libyans at the western frontier of Egypt, according to the depiction of the king's dog attacking the Libyan chief. Furthermore, the triumphal scenes of Ramesses II depicted him smiting Libyan captives in the presence of gods were recorded three times at the great temple of Abu Simbel, the small temple of Abu Simbel, and the temple of Beit el -Wali. Both of the scene of the small temple of Abu Simbel and the scene of the temple of Beit el-Wali were accompanied by rhetorical texts refer to the victory of Ramses II over the Libyans. It is known, according to previous Egyptologists, that the Ramesside triumph scenes are a generalized summary of the battle reliefs. Therefore, it seems that these scenes associated with the other Libyan war scenes of the king, which are registered in the same temples, in order to commemorate his military victory over the Libyans during his reign. The reality of the Libyan war of Ramesses II is confirmed archeologically in his forts at the Libyan frontier, based upon the inscriptions and reliefs which recorded his victory over the Libyans on a door jamb and some royal and private stele discovered in the forts of Ramesses II at Zawit Omur Rahm and El Alamin. The owner of one of these private stele from Zawit Omar Rahm was a military officer, was a military officer, standard bearer. This indicates that he may have participated personally in this war. Furthermore, it was remarkable in two private stele from Zawit Omar Rahm that Ramses II is depicted smiting and slaughtering a Libyan captive in the presence of Amun. According to the theory, of Alan Schulman, which stated that the smiting scenes on private Ramesside stele reflect in part actual historical events, both of Stephen Snape and Penny Wilson suggested that Zawit Omar Rahm would have witnessed Ramses II carrying out ritual smiting of Libyan prisoners in front of each temple, presumably at the end of a major Libyan campaign early in his reign. It seems that the Libyan war of Ramses II have taken place very early in his reign, based upon the presence of the Libyan scenes at the temple of Beit el-Wali, which dates to the beginning of the first Sol of the Pharaoh's Sol reign, and the results of the archaeological excavations at Ramses II's fort in Zawit Omar Rahm, which revealed that its construction was launched was launched very early in his reign. I think that Ramses II had debented in his Libyan war on his chariotry, according to the presence of traces of scenes at his temple fortress in Zawit Omar Rahm, showing the king getting out of his chariot to smite his enemies as stated by Labib Habashi. Additionally, the presence of the military title 
Lieutenant Commander of the Chariotry of the Lord of the Two Lands in the Western Tract or Delta region, which held by the Lieutenant Commander of Chariotry, Marie Atom, dating to the reign of Ramesses II, could support this perspective as well. Judging from a text recorded on Ramses II red granite fragmentary stella from his fort at Al Alamin, as well as a section of papyrus and statue praised Ramses II as a warrior, it appears that the Libo or Ribo were the major element in the Libyan war of Ramses II. This perspective seems to be emphasized according to their domination of the Libyan tribes in the Libyan war of Merimbetah many years later. Finally, the Libyan War of Ramesses II is described as a historical event in some of his significant historical texts, such as a rhetorical stela from Tanis, now in Cairo, Cairo Museum, uh, CGC 34510, as one stela of year two, and Babylon and Stasui II. It has been noted that the rhetorical stela of Ramesses II from Tanis recorded the employment of the Libyan captives in the Egyptian military service after the victory of the Pharaoh over them. The military employment of the war captives was an imperial policy during the reign of Ramesses II that usually occurred after a battle. He employed the Sheridan warriors in the Egyptian military service after his victory over them in a battle at the beginning of Israel, as stated in his historical records. Therefore, this provides more details about the events of the Libyan war of Ramesses II, representing in the capture of a number of a Libyan captives that impressed into the Egyptian army. Thank you very much for your attention. I have finished my presentation, but before I leave, I would like just to dedicate all of my works and efforts in this conference to the soul of my beloved mother, Mrs. Suad Zedkirsin, which I lost since few months. From here, I can say to her soul, thank you, dear mom, for everything. And finally, thank you very much, dear colleagues, for your attention.